everybody. Uh, today we'll, uh, we'll have a second class about funding your startup company. Last week we talked about bootstrapping, we talked about angel investments, many kinds of angels. We, talk, we talked about crowdfunding, we talked about non-equity funding, this means especially government funding, and we started speaking about venture capital. Today we'll go on discussing venture capital as a source of funding for your startup company. The slide where we stopped last week spoke about the valuation of the company. We spoke about conventions and we spoke about growth. As I said, valuation is determined by a bunch of things. We'll soon go into the various uh, elements that decide over the valuation of the company. Usually we see it growing. We see your share in the equity going down, but normally the value of your share going up. And we spoke about what happens when things don't go as expected. Now, how do we calculate the valuation of a company that has no sales, that is working in a completely new arena, and that uh, nobody has any experience in evaluating? But this is really challenging. There are various factors that determine the valuation of the company. First of all, it's the reputation of the, engineer, of the founding team. If you are famous, if you've done it before, then your reputation goes to the company and you'll be able to get a better, a better valuation for the company right up front. A former student of mine called Ishai Green started his first company still as a student at my class in the IDC. Um, he had an exit 22 months down the road. He sold the company for $20 million to McAfee. And he told me that he knew at this point that he would not be able to get a good valuation for the company. He would not be able to negotiate over the valuation of his company because he is a first timer. He then started his second company. And in the second company, he was successful in negotiating. The company then sold for about $130 million. So at first, you have to be patient and understand that you have less uh, negotiation uh, muscle. The second element is comparable. Again, if you know companies that are similar in some ways to your own, or you can convince your investors that they are similar in certain parameter, you can point out the current valuation of this particular company, and from this, determine the valuation that you think should apply to your own company, looking at multiples. Do you know what multiples are? Multiple, a multiple is when you take the valuation of the company and divide it by the returns of the company. Okay, so if you have a certain uh, multiple that exists in the market, you can refer to your own income, use the multiple, and create a value that you can use when negotiating with your investor. A very important element of deciding the valuation of the company is the ask. How much money are you asking for at this particular point? If you want to raise $100,000, you won't be able to tell your investors that the company valuation is $10 million because they'll, they'll get such a small fraction of your equity that it doesn't make sense for them to invest. So there's a strong correlation with the ask, with the amount of money that you are about to ask for and the valuation that you can negotiate. However, you Oftentimes, you wouldn't like to ask for too much. The, the, the amount of money that you want to ask is, again, a question that you have to think about from the start. As I told you last week, funding your company is a long trail that goes between fundable milestones, right? You go from one milestone to the other, and then to the other, and then to the other, and each time 
you create a milestone, you have to evaluate how much time and how much money you will need to go from milestone A to milestone B to milestone C. Question. Uh, what is the, in terms of time, what is reasonable to ask, for instance, if I, 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 how much I'm going to need in the first half a year, or one year, or three years? Well, it's not so much the time. The question was, how much time do I need to ask when I fund the company? The answer is, it's not the time, it's more the milestones. And if you have a milestone which is 18 months away from you, you figure out how much money you will need to get to this milestone, how much money you will have to pay on employees, perhaps on equipment in certain uh, verticals. So today, you know, the investors are very uh, tough in the time they will be showing something. And let's say that the time for the first micro milestone is one year. Should I ask for one year or half a year and at that moment starting to wait for the second half year? Well, uh, the question was, uh, can I compromise on the amount that I need to get to the next milestone, okay? Now, if your investors are smart, they will understand that you need to get to a fundable milestone because you want to add other investors into the pool, okay? If you have investors that want to choke you or kill the company, this is not an investor that you would like to have in your company, okay? So you have to sit down together with your investors and figure out the amount of money and time that you need to get to the next milestone which is fundable and then to think together whom you could add as an investor at this point in time. So the milestone is the criteria? Look, the, the milestones can be a bunch of things. Uh, later on in the course we will look at a company that asked for $100,000 in order to create its business plan. Okay? Now this is very unusual. You usually don't, uh, you don't fund the business planning pr process, okay? But in this case, he managed to do so, okay? So of course, the, the milestones are negotiable, but there is, you know, a certain uh, paradigm that you need to follow. Okay. Now, uh, another element that determines the valuation of the company is whether you, are, you have been successful so far. Now, if you're an internet company, what could, uh, or, a, or a, social, a social company, what would be a, a, a criteria for success in this case? If you're a company like Waze, or like Babylon, yes. or like Facebook, what would be a good criteria to show your success? Your rating. Your rating, in other words, Popularity, okay? Traction. Traction, exactly. So they speak about eyeballs. When Yossi Valdi was negotiating with AOL over the sale of ICQ, the price went up every day because the price was a function of the number of users. And they had a very strong growth. And hence, he showed them how the company valuation is going up every day to make the uh, agreement go through faster. So if you're a... B2C, traction is often a strong uh, criteria to determining the valuation of a company. What about if you're a B2C company, B2B company, business to business? What would determine, what would assist you in determining a valuation for the company? Your income. Okay, if you already have income, if you already have sales, then the extent of sales, the growth in sales, okay, the type of companies you are selling to, the potential, if you have letters of intent, okay, or memorandum of understanding, all these will con contribute to understanding the valuation and the potential of your company. And what do we know about the conventions? If you are raising from friends and family or from accelerators, then if you're raising $15,000, you could give away 5% of your company. If you're looking at an investment 25, you could give away 10% of the company. Again, not set in stone, but this type of equity for investment. 
If you're looking at angel investments, if you're asking for $100,000, 10% would make sense. If you're asking for $600, 20% would make sense. Now, if you're looking at this number, if you're asking for $600,000 and you're giving, of course, we're missing the K here, right? And you're giving away 20% of the company, what's the valuation of the company at the time of the funding? Okay, if we're looking at an investment of $600,000 and the investor got 20%, what do we know about the valuation? It's five times 600K. Okay, but so the valuation of the company would be $3 million. At what point in time? just after the investment took place, right? So it's called after the money. After the money. What was the valuation of the company five minutes before the contract was signed? It could be zero if there had never been an investment before, right? But in the eyes of the investor, what is the value of the company just before he or she signs the contract. The potential of the idea. Yes, can you put a number? The amount he wants to give. Well, if, if the company became, just after he put in $600,000, ah, if the company that. valuation is now $3 million, it's then five minutes ago... $3 million minus Right, it would be $2.4 million. And this is what we call the valuation before the investment. Because whoever decided to give $600,000 to the company in exchange for 20%, okay, he must have thought that the company, before he put in this sum of money, the company's valuation should be $2.4 million. Question? Yes. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Why? Because uh, he bought in a 600K 20%, but this 20% were exist before, they just uh, moved to his hand. Yes. So the company is actually before the investment. Well, you missed, you missed last week's uh, lecture. Okay. Look it up in the, in the class uh, uh, module and you'll, you'll see what happened to the shares, okay? okay. The allocation of shares and the, and the percentages. Other questions? Okay, let's look at another convention. If we are looking at a $2 million investment by a venture cap capitalist, one scenario could be, I take 33%, you have 67%, and what's the valuation of the company then? 20, uh, multiplied 50. Talk about the You're talking about $2 million, 33%, okay? I give you... $2 million, I get a third of a company. How much, what is the value of the company? Okay, let's look at before and after. After the money? $6 million. Before the money? Six minus two. That's $4 million, right? Because if a third of the company is worth $2 million, how much is the whole company worth? Obviously, $6 million. This means that the minute before the investor put the money, the company valuation is $4 million. Okay? Questions so far? These are a few examples of famous companies. One is less famous, but we'll uh, look at it uh, later on in the course. So Dropbox, first investment was from Y Combinator. They got $20,000 for, 
they gave away 5%. What's the valuation of the company at this point after the money? $400, $400,000, right? Avi Aron, oh, Avi Aron, yeah. Avi Aron gave 25% of his company. He got $100,000 from Sherpa Group in order to develop a business plan for the company. What's the valuation of the company after the money? $400,000 before the money? $300,000, okay? A moment before they gave them $100,000, they evaluated the company at $300,000. How about Instagram? Instagram got their first in investment, a very large first in investment, $500,000 for Baseline Ventures. They gave away 20%. What's the value of the company before the investment? $2 million. $2 million before the investments. That's a very high valuation for a company. These were not repeat entrepreneurs but their investors thought they were good enough to get the money, okay? Now, investors uh, tend, to, uh, tend to, uh, tell you that a part of the money, they will also bring in some of their own connections, know-how, experience, okay? Do they do that? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. If there's a good click between the investor and the investee, you will see the investor actually helping you run the company. But in fact, when a VC fund makes an investment, they trust you to run the company. They will not make an investment if they think you'll be dependent on them. They only make the investment if you think if they trust you to be able to run their company, but they will assist you here and there. Okay, so these are the things that they can help you with. One of the most um, challenging things that Israeli companies need to cope with is finding a counterpart in the United States or finding the employee that will sell their uh, product outside of the country. Israeli, Israeli companies are often look at the American uh, market. Some of them look at the European market. Now we're looking at China. Japan, but the big market for Israeli high tech is still the United States. And a, a huge challenge is finding this, the, the management of the US uh, operation, which focuses mainly on, if you're opening an office in the US, what would be the purpose of this office? Sales. Marketing and sales, act exactly, all right? And then you have to employ somebody and select somebody who comes from a very different culture. Unlike Israel, where you can make two phone calls and find everything about everybody, here you've no idea whom to call, and if you do call them, they won't tell you anything, all right? They'll tell you the time that they worked for them, when they started, when they stopped, what they did, that's it. It will be very, very hard to get an opinion from a former employer about an employee. In this case, venture capital funds have a role and sometimes they are very proactive in helping you get the right kind of employee in the target market. When I'm talk to, talking about entry strategies, what do I mean? Sorry? When I say that the uh, Exactly. When I talk about entry strategies, I'm talking about entering new markets. Okay, every high-tech company needs to make its first appearance in the target market. This is always difficult. And here, this is another point where your investors can help at times. And of course, growth study, uh, strategies. How do you grow? How do you go beyond the first enthusiasts in your company to the later um, more standard uh, market. Then, of course, there's a question of negotiation. It's extremely hard to negotiate, especially if you're a techie with limited experience in running companies and negotiating and selling to somebody that comes from a different culture. Okay, so that's another point where entrepreneurs need a lot of support. 
Yeah. When you talk about growth, you're talking about the the extent of the market or the develop the uh, develop of the product. Okay. The question was: When I'm looking at growth strategies, am I looking at growing into the existing market? Am I looking at growing into other markets, whether this growth is geographical or with other products? Or am I looking into new products which will expand to other markets? Yeah? They, they, they are all, these are all possible. Most of the time, venture capitalists will not invest in a company that has a single product. This is called a, a one product company and it's not good enough. They want to see a wider base of products, okay? Well, because they know, like, uh, maybe Elon Musk, he, at first he made the electric car and then he did it, uh, you know, it, his product was uh, in okay. steps. You're talking, about, you're talking about Elon Musk and the way he built the autonomic, uh, the autonomic car, car yeah. right? At, at every point in time, he added one extra layer, yeah. all right? Now, this is, of course, incredible. And Elon Musk is not a very typical example because he already came with previous successes, such as PayPal, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, this is a very interesting way of developing a product, okay? Adding more layers to it, yes. right? So we see this happening in many other ways. If you look at the Israeli company, at the Israeli example of Mobileye. Yes. Okay. Actually, I, I told the class, uh, students in this class 12 years ago developed a business plan for Mobileye. And in this case, again, they went layer after layer after layer. First the device on the dashboard. Absolutely. And, the and, and aiming at the autonomous cars, which is a huge market. And now a lot of people uh, look at Mobileye as the intel of the mobile car, okay, of the autonomous uh, car. So, again, we can get, as young entrepreneurs, we can get some assistance from our investors, people on our board, coach, coaching, etc., et and again, they can help us get additional funding at the next funding round. Coaching. What do I mean by coaching? Well, I spoke, uh, I spoke about uh, your venture capitalist, but in fact, we see a lot of entrepreneurs who get mentors, and the mentors don't necessarily have to be your investor. They can be other mentors, okay? And then you have a mentor with whom you can, you can discuss, first of all, at times of crisis, but also when you are rewriting the company strategy. Well, coaching and mentoring. Yeah. So, um, what I often uh, recommend, I recommend to young entrepreneurs to build a board. It can be either a formal or an informal board that you will consult with on a monthly basis, sometimes more, when you are figuring out what you're doing. And there are so many points of crisis in the lifetime of a company, of a startup company, that you really... Um, that depends. That depends on the nature of the VC. But uh, w what I think is if you have a very strong person on your board when you approach the venture capital company, then they will have to match the level of this person when they assign a partner in the venture fund to sit on your board. Okay? So what happens when the investment takes place somebody from the venture capital uh, fund becomes a member of your board, okay? And then they, they see and they follow up on the company either on a monthly or on a uh, quarter, usually on a monthly basis. But it's a real board, it's not the advisory board. It's a real board. Yeah. It's a real board. And I think uh, Jody spoke about the, the board and the responsibilities of the board, okay? Now, again, when advertising themselves, the venture capitalists will tell you that this is what they can do and this is what they will do, but eventually it depends a lot on the success of the company and on the success of creating a personal relationship with your investor because the investors themselves have so much on their plates that they can't devote more than 
a certain amount of time to their portfolio companies. Okay. Now, when venture capital in Israel hardly existed before the 90s. What we saw, we saw a few investment bodies such as uh, the Skash, and we saw one VC which was uh, started by Dan Tolkovsky, the former head of the Air Force. It was called Athena, but it was a single investor. And then in 1992, the Israeli government decided to create a venture capital industry in Israel. A very unusual decision to which they allocated $100 million. Now, if you look at funds today, how much money do they raise for each fund? You'll see funds that run $150 million, $200 million, $400 million. In this particular case, the government allocated $100 million for the whole industry. However, they had some terms that made the sum a little larger. The initiative was called Yozma, the English word for initiative. And it led to the development of a very, very profound venture capital industry in Israel by doing the following. At first, each venture capital fund got $8 million from the government and they had to get another $12 million, creating a $20 million fund, okay? Then it went so well that the government decided to ask for more, so they still gave $8 million and they asked for a little more. I can't remember, perhaps 20 or $25 million for the funds to raise. Now the terms were excellent. The terms said that if you wanted to sell your share to the government, they will buy it back. Only two out of the 10 venture capital funds asked for the government to buy, buy them back. Other than that, it was touch and go. You took the money, you didn't owe anything to the government. All the terms were similar to the terms of the American VC industry. A great success, really. Okay? What we're seeing now is a $10 billion industry in Israel. which started off with IT and medical devices, okay? Because IT came from where? Yes, from the defense industry, okay? We see a lot of IT in the defense industry. Industry We see uh, vision processing, we see voice processing, we see cryptography, we see communications. So all these uh, domains were very strong in Israel. Uh, how about medical devices? In many cases, the same characteristics apply to medical devices, okay? If you're developing a CT machine, you need to have the image processing, okay? Etc. Etc. So we saw the beginning of a medical device industry which grew very fast. Now we have a whole lot of various industries. Um, the hot industries right now is the autonomous car and cyber security and other stuff. So we're seeing a lot of very interesting autonomous car. Now, we spoke about the investors. We spoke about the investors of the venture capital industry. Whom did we say invest in venture capital? Do you remember? We spoke about bodies that need to manage huge amounts of money, such as banks, insurance firms, pension funds, okay? Now, this is considered a very risky asset class. Now, when somebody manages a lot of money, they want to divide the money among various asset classes, okay? They, will in, they may uh, want to invest in gold or in, uh, in the bonds or in stocks or in the Japanese market, or et cetera, et cetera, all right? And they look at this asset class of venture capital 
and they say, okay, this may be risky, but we don't want to miss out on this, and we will allocate a certain amount, a very, very tiny percentage of the money that we are running in order to invest it in venture funds. Okay? How about the Israeli players? Do we see Israeli pension funds investing in uh, venture capital in Israel? No, this is very rare. And in fact, I think they were right in not doing so because we haven't seen the funds uh, very successful recently. The first harvest was excellent. The 90s were great for venture funds, but then we had a very slow period and uh, it's, it's not clear whether they should invest in venture funds at all. So what the trust fund is? Nothing to do with this. Okay, look, let's look at the su some of the numbers to get a feel of, uh, of what it's like. Can you see what, uh, what we're seeing here? This is the amount of money that venture capital companies raised over the last years. Starting when? Starting 2007, ending with an estimate of two, 2017. So we're looking at a 10 plus year period and we're seeing how much money the venture capital companies are raising. What, are, what uh, can we see in 2009? What is the impact that created the poor uh, funding of 2009 and 2010? Crisis. Yes, we had a big financial crisis in 2008, and hence it was more difficult to raise money to venture funds at this period. So here you have two lines. You have the number of deals or the number of funds, and you have the amount of money that they raise. What happened in 2017? I don't know. Well, 2017, they don't have the, the figures yet. We are still in 2017s. <laughs> because we are still at the beginning. Oh. Okay. Yeah, what happened in 2017? I, I repeat in most questions. Um, look at again, look at this graph. What do you see in this graph? Yes, you see how much money is invested in various rounds, okay? We have early rounds and we have very late rounds and we see the amount of money that's invested in each kind of round. A round is a milestone? Mm -hmm. A round is a round of funding, okay? If you're funding for a seed stage or you're funding for a growth stage or you're fun funding for a later stage, all right? An interesting insight here that uh, the amount of money invested here in startup companies by Israeli VCs, how much do you think is invested by Israeli VCs and how much is invested by foreign VCs? What percentage? 30 and 70. Well, at, for a long time it was about half and half. But over the years, the Israeli industry uh, became much more interesting for foreign investors. And here the case is that Israel is only, Israeli funds are only responsible for 13% of the investments. 13%, yes. And we're seeing uh, Chinese companies spending a lot of money and of course American and others. Let's uh, look at the exits between 2006 and 2015. Again, a 10 year period. How many companies were sold? And how much did they total? What is the amount? Ah. It's in uh, billions of dollars. Okay, so that's very impressive. Yes. Can you and see it again? Yes. This is very interesting. And yeah. if we look on a worldwide basis, even if we look at absolute numbers, Israel is doing extremely well. Okay, so it's. It's not as much as Silicon Valley, but it's not far from uh, Boston and New York and London. Okay, so. What happened in 2006? I don't know. <laughs> but sometimes you see that there is a particular, like if you look at the statistic of 2017, you will see the impact of the $15 billion exit. And then we saw the exit of uh, Keter and the exit of uh, Iskar that uh, sold to Warren Buffett. So sometimes you, you see irregular things changing the statistics. Oh, it's even if it's not high -tech, uh... 
Um, no, you're right, in the case of Keter, it wouldn't be. And these are the absolute numbers. So if you look at Israel, we, we are twice as big as Canada. How many uh, citizens live in Canada? Much more than Israel, right? Of course, the United States is, uh, is huge. And another graph shows the, the, uh, the confidence. They took a, a confidence survey in the VC industry, and Israel came second only to the United States. So all in all, we see a great level of confidence and very considerable investments in the Israeli venture funds. This is an old slide, so please disregard the figures. However, it's interesting to, say, to see where Israel is situated when you look at the numbers and when you look at the number of deals, okay? So if we're looking at the numbers, where is Israel? Israel is number seven, which is pretty good. But if we're looking at the number of deals, Israel? is a third. Why is that? Why do we come third in the number of deals? Because there are a lot small of small deals. Most of the deals are small. Early stages. Small. Yes. The truth is that Israeli companies are considered to be very cash efficient. They manage to go a longer way on the same amount of money. And hence, we see the investments smaller in Israeli companies and in other companies. Well, if we look at the point of view of the entrepreneur, what do we need to know? First of all, you have to ignore the myths. The word venture capital in Hebrew includes the word risk, okay? In Hebrew, we say risk capital. And then entrepreneurs complain about the venture capitalist for not taking risks. Now, what do you think? Should the venture capitalist be taking risks? They have to. They have to. What kind of risks? Early stages startups. Well, you're saying that in any case, if you're investing in an early stage startup, this is risky, yeah. right? However, the risks are very calculated. The venture capitalists are report to the investors and they want to make sure that they can get the, the next round of investors, okay? Like startup companies, venture capital companies have to raise funding from time to time. Why is that? Whoa. We spoke about the term, remember? We spoke about the term of the venture fund. How many years does a venture fund exist? Normally, it would be for seven to ten years. What happens next? You have to raise another company, another venture fund, another fund, okay? So we will soon see Ed Malofsky from Gemini. So we had Gemini 1, and then we had Gemini 2, and then we had Gemini 3, okay? And this means that sometime in the life of Gemini 1, the founders and managers of the venture fund need to start raising for their next fund, right? So they too are responsible to their investors and they want to get their investors to invest again. And they don't want to take too many risks. So they will only take risks if they think there's a huge upside. Okay, if you think this is going to be a billion dollar company, then they will assume that the risk, again, a calculated risk, and they will think out together with the founders how to avoid and how to take care of these risks if and when they appear. But to come to a company and, and to, to tell the managers, but you are a risk investment company, then you should assume the risk and invest in us, won't work. Question. Isn't it a conflict between the short-termism of the VC fund and the long-termism of the um, I don't know, CEO or the 
founder of the company? So you're saying, what if the VC fund comes to an end before the company, the startup company, uh, was successful? Mm -hmm. and, and they want to show results to the investors. And yes, they want to show results to the investors. Want, wants to make it big. And, yes, uh, you're right. So you hope that within the time of the company, its first investments in year one, two, or three will have already succeeded. Okay? And once you have succeeded, you can show results. It's not always the case. Of course, in the time of the bubble, we saw things happening very, very fast. But it can take more time. And of course, if you're looking at a venture fund that uh, specializes on uh, biotech, it will have a longer term because you, you can't expect anything to happen seven years in a biotech company. Question? Does the VCs are uh, publishing the time frame when was the release and when it will be next? Okay, so the question is, do I as entrepreneur know when the VC fund was started and when we expect it to, to be out of business? Well, everything, well, many, many uh, um, uh, pieces of data are public. When the VC fund raises, you know how much they raised. You know when they raised, you know when they close the company. When they invest, they usually advertise how much they invest. So usually you know a lot both about how much money they still have to invest and both about the, the time frame. Now what happens in your opinion if we have two venture funds, let's say the Germany one uh, uh, invested in company X, and X is now going to a second round of funding. What do you think will happen vis-a-vis -vis Gemini 2? Can company X go to Gemini 2 and ask for funding? Yes. Yes. Why? Because it's the same deal. Are the investors of Gemini 2 necessarily the same investors as Gemini 1? No, not necessarily. So there can be a conflict of interest, okay? There can be a case in which the investors of company X are finding it hard to find investors from other venture funds, and they go to company 2, to Gemini 2, or to Pitango 2, or to whoever Concord 2, and they ask them to invest, but we are afraid of the conflict of interest because it's the same people that may be managing these two funds and we want to make a clear cut. And, and there is people from Gemini, Gemini 1 that's in the Absolutely, board, absolutely. They don't want no exactly. To so we want to make sure this does not happen and this, it doesn't happen, okay? Otherwise you're breaking the rules. So I talked about one of the myths. There's a second myth that Entrepreneurs often think that the venture capitalists that are investing in them know a hell of a lot. They know everything. Again, if you are a good entrepreneur, you will probably have a better understanding of your own market than the venture capitalist. This not, may not be the case in the very early time when you are a very young entrepreneur, but they expect you to master your field. Okay? Don't expect the venture capitalist to tell you what you need to do and how the, the, your market behaves. This is something that you have to develop and expertise that you have to develop for yourself. Now, I want to speak about the mode of investment. Okay, I mentioned that you had a, two, a term sheet, a two-stage uh, process. First, a, a term sheet that uh, describes the general uh, idea of the investment. And at the second stage, you have a very, very long contract. You sign the contract. It's called closing and then you get the money. You can get the money in milestones. Sometimes they will allocate a certain amount. I was involved in a deal that uh, involved a $1 million investment. First uh, a milestone, half a million. Second milestone, they never got the money because they did not reach the milestone. Okay, so this often happens, the milestones. The second thing is that uh, often VCs like to go in groups. So, Gemini may ask Genesis and Bitango to join it in a particular investment. And why is that? Why do we see venture funds making joint investments? Sure, there is. Yes, 
in, in, in some way, it's sharing the risk and seeing how other companies react to this new idea or new company, okay? However, we will always have a lead investor, okay? The lead investor is your point of contact and the lead investor will add the other investors. In the case of the angel investors, we will see single investors and we will see angel groups, okay? And if you look at single investors, they will have completely different ways of assessing the, the opportunity. So if you look at uh, Yuda Doron or Avi Engel, you will see that they take their time. They want to spend a while with the entrepreneur and see how he or she develops along this time. And this may take weeks or months. But if you look at Zohar Gilon, for instance, he will meet the company once for 75 minutes and make a decision. Okay, so you have different styles. Now, if you're looking at groups of angels, again, you will have a, probably have a investment committee that looks at the companies, perhaps different people looking at companies in different domains and recommending an investment. Okay. We spoke about the growing valuation and the value add added, and now how much should I raise? So somebody brought this up earlier today. How much money should I raise? If I think I need $1 million, should I raise $1 million, half a million dollars, $2 million? How much should I actually raise compared to what I think I need? What do you say? <laughs> Double. Double. Why? Because you want the space of the breeze. Yeah, you want a margin, okay? Because entrepreneurs are so optimistic, then you may want to say, I think it's going to cost me a million dollars and seven months or 12 months. However, knowing how hard it is to evaluate, my estimate will be $2 million. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is again, raise when you can. We saw before the impact of the crisis, okay? So uh, the venture capital investments are tied to other invest to, to the terms of the market on the whole. So if we see a negative market in the stock exchange, we may encounter fear of investors to make investments in this period. So some people recommend if you can raise a lot of money, raise it now. Okay. Mm, what's a counter uh, a counter uh, thought about raising a lot of money? Why would you want to wait with raising a lot of money? Yeah. Because uh, uh, maybe maybe third party can sue you and take all the money, and if you don't have uh, the, the, the lot of money in your uh... usually when when uh, entrepreneurs like to defer the funding, it's because they think they can get a better valuation. If I wait another year, we will uh, be evaluated as a better company and we'll, we will have to give away less equity, okay? So that's a reason that entrepreneurs ref sometimes refrain from taking money. And since it's so easy to start a company nowadays, I mean, you know, when, uh, for instance, if you look at the fourth dimension, the company was started in the 80s when they had to pay thousands of shekels for using, for buying an hour of computer power, okay? So here we have all the resources are available and companies can actually go quite a long way without funding, without external funding, okay? Now let's take a look at the, okay. I, we have to, to stop here and I'll stop with the last line which, spe which speaks about a marriage, okay? Taking money from an investor means that you are married to them. It means that they become owners of your company together with you, okay? So you have to make sure you like them because you're going to spend a long time together with them. Divorcing an investor is worse than divorcing your wife or husband. So make sure you're getting along well. Okay, we'll uh, continue uh, after Passover. Please take five minutes and then we'll go on to Ed Malavsky's talk, a venture capitalist who will describe 
what happened in Israel during his tenure at the Bird Foundation and in Gemini. Thank you.